I'm Nancy Littlejohn with Nancy Littlejohn Fine Art in Houston, Texas. We're here today to visit with New York-based artist Deborah Brown. She has her first solo exhibition at the gallery called Nomad Exquisite, and we're going to start our conversation with her reading a beautiful poem by Wallace Stevens called Nomad Exquisite. I first became uh, acquainted with Wallace Stevens' poems because I took a course when I was in college only on Wallace Stevens, if you can imagine that, with um, this kind of eminence grease of English literature, Harold Bloom, who's a, kind of a well-known uh, professor at Yale. And uh, I just, I was really probably not up to understanding all the stuff in his work, because he's a very complicated writer. And he's kind of a metaphysical poet, so that means like things beyond what you can see. But I, I love his poetry, and I think this title really captured my imagination because it seemed to relate to the journey of the female protagonist in these paintings. So I thought, what a great idea. <laughs> I don't know if it is, but to it call is. this um, show Nomad Exquisite. So, Nomad Exquisite by Wallace Stevens. As the immense dew of Florida brings forth the big thin palm and green vine angering for life, as the immense dew of Florida brings forth him and him from the beholder, beholding all these green sides and gold sides of green sides, and blessed mornings meet for the eye of the young alligator and lightning colors, so in me comes flinging forms, flames, and the flakes of flames. So I think he's calling forth this great response that we as humans have to the physical world. So there's, um, there are uh, colors and lightning colors, and there are physical things like dew and um, a thinned palm where you can feel the, the kind of spiny growth of the landscape. And, uh, but these things, I think, are a vehicle to explore uh, things that are not just in the perceptual world. They're a vehicle to explore emotions and ideas and ideas about how we relate to nature. And uh, just the way he rotates the point of view around the landscape to actually land in the eye of the alligator. Like, that's sort of a bizarre thing. So he's sort of questioning, I think, um, you know, where our consciousness is and how it relates to nature. Um, and I think this is actually a great metaphor for how we relate to art, because I think um, like poetry, painting and artists tip us off to be more aware of things that surround us all the time that maybe we are not paying enough attention to. And certainly he's doing that by dissecting the landscape in these minute ways. And uh, I think I, as an artist, am interested in the natural world, and I'm interested in creating a narrative around it that reflects, I think, how I see my place in it, and then maybe how I try and I try and relate it to maybe a broader notion of how um, we relate to the natural world and to um, uh, other kinds of ideas. Um, so this poem was sort of a starting point for me. Um, but uh, I, I think probably you'd like me to talk about like how I came to this work. <laughs> I would. Specifically. I would. But I also <laughs> love poetry, and I particularly loved this this poem and his use of simple words that uh, define a space or a place, and how his work is all about beauty and nature. And there are some religious aspects. Evidently, he is a very religious person. Um, but I think there's so much to be read in this work and, for example, your use of the female protagonist. So do you want to talk to us a little bit about um, your strong female protagonist and do you imagine this person as yourself or as someone else? She could be so many things. I think originally it was, uh, I, I came to this work not just painting nude figures in landscapes, uh, but um, by um, a previous series that was called Runaways, because I have a studio in this industrial area in Brooklyn that has a lot of uh, decaying urban architecture, but it also has a kind of ruined nature in it, because a lot of the buildings are collapsing into trees, and trees are growing out of them. And uh, walking around the neighborhood, I found several dogs and birds that I adopted. They were runaways, they were strays. I have some of them still. And it kind of sparked my imagination about the idea of a, of a 
female character who goes through a strange landscape and then has adventures with, with animals. <laughs> I mean, it was based on my own experience. And so I started painting that, and the figure originally had clothes. Uh, but I began to feel that she was too specifically tied to a contemporary context and that that limited the, the readings of that figure and only sort of forced her into one time and period mm -hmm. and narrative. And so I took her clothes off and then, without any real grand idea of what that would lead to, but I think it immediately opened up a dialogue with a lot of past art, because Western art Definitely. has a lot of nude figures in it, and they're from the Bible, mythology, uh, like more modernist and, and uh, 19th century art has uh, bathers. I mean, so it's like there's many, many ways you can read a nude figure in the Western canon. And my work began, to, I thought, to open up a dialogue with those things. Um, when I said that, that like poetry is, is gesturing toward these broader worlds, that's kind of what I was hoping to do by this iconography. Mm -hmm. It's really an iconography. Like Definitely. we as Western viewers come to um, the nude figure having this baggage from a, seeing a lot of paintings in, you know, whether you saw them in churches or in museums or, or in illustrations of books or whatever, there is this history. And so uh, I thought that I would be channeling that. And then as I went on, I, got, I made her more specifically a character. It wasn't really so much me, but a, a kind of an archetype. Definitely. And I think putting her in the canoe, I'm, I mean, I have done a lot of canoeing in the Boundary Waters, which Emily, you may know from the Quetico is the Canadian part, like it goes into Canada and the, we have, in Minnesota, we have the Boundary Waters and it's this pristine wilderness area where you can canoe into. Um, and so I have done a lot of canoeing and I thought giving her the canoe gave her more agency mm -hmm. and made her perhaps somebody who was on a voyage, a journey. Um, and then I began to see the, the parallels with the myth of Charon, the, uh, the ferryman who ferries the dead from our world in Greek mythology right. to, um, um, from the world of the living to the world of the dead. And she was kind of a death maiden. Um, and so it, there were many different things that could be read into it, but those were some of the things I was thinking of. So going back to the animals as companions, either the horse or the dog, how is this important to your work? And is this companionship something you experience in your own life? Like, I think some, this dog is yours. Yeah, Zeus, who is not alive anymore, he oh. passed away a year ago, um, is, is my dog. And he right. uh, was, I thought, sort of the sidekick companion that I placed into her world. And uh, I thought it, it, it made her, I mean, in some ways a more specific character because she had this dog, but also a more enigmatic character because was the dog her protector or, or was it a, 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 someone she had turned a male figure into an animal, like mm -hmm. Circe from the Odyssey who turned men into animals. And um, they were her, the lions and other fierce creatures were her docile companions. So there's that, that link of, like, I mean, it looks as though she's run away with her dog and that's probably the most dominant narrative, but he's sort of the lookout, the person, I mean, the character who's, right, right. who's watching out for her. Right. I mean, maybe they're in exile from a domestic setting and she took her dog with her. Maybe she ran away mm -hmm. from civilization, from a more, a setting where you would have a dog in a home or something. So it was sort of a fanciful, but also personal thing because my dog is my sidekick. And yeah. um, it like so many people. <laughs> So I also know that you have a few of these paintings that depict horses, and when I look at these paintings, I immediately reach back to Greek mythology, you know, specifically the River Styx and that story about being in the earth and going to the underworld, and I was reading something recently about the vessels, if they weren't made from horse hooves, they would sink. I know. So and something in the horse with the made them boy. Yes. Well, it's Greek mythology, so we don't really know. <laughs> right. <laughs> but then I was wondering if you knew that, and, or what is the tie of the horses that you're using as well? Well, when I came here, I think two years ago, I saw all the, um, I mean, the, there were some Remingtons in the collection of the MFA, mm -hmm. or, or there was a show of them. I can't remember what it was. I bought a Remington book at the bookstore here. And I started to look at these horses and his night paintings, and they began to feel like something I wanted to appropriate. So I, without using the horse in as specific a symbol as you describe, I, I thought it was a compliment to the 
iconography that I was using. Well, and I can tell that now that you mention it, some of the lighting in those is very, very similar to um, Remington. I love the way he lit these, like with the blonde lighting and the purple shadows. Definitely. And then he has a whole bunch of night paintings, which also are fantastic. But uh, I've been looking at his paintings for a long time, and uh, they, I think just the simplicity of the figures against the backgrounds and the animal human bond mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. amazing to me. So going back to Nomad Exquisite and the narrative in each painting in this journey that, um, do you imagine this journey while you're creating the paintings? I try and give her a stance and an expression that is specific but open-ended. So mm -hmm. it looks as though she might be purposeful, but perhaps could be startled by the presence of you, the observer. It's not clear, like, what, I think I try and engage the viewer as the other element in the painting so that you are in a ambiguous relationship to her. Mm -hmm. Are you watching her as a stalker? Are you watching her as a friend? Are you watching a kind of archetypal scene uh, that is being played out? And I think I really got into that in the prints because they're so simple. They, I really reduced them to just these very silhouette-like shapes. And I think that kind of timeless quality and archaic quality comes out and you feel this could have be a scene that's been enacted before. Definitely, most definitely. So do you see her, and maybe it's just because I see her as a goddess figure? Yes, definitely. Right, in, in Presiding we, over this world that is uh, maybe only, uh, you know, she's the only person in it, but mm -hmm. it's, it, it is her world, her creation. Maybe she's invented it. It's, maybe you've invented it. It's, it's a... Maybe both. Right. It's open-ended, I think. So um, when I think of the goddess and these you know, paintings, but generally speaking, they represent so many things. It's the goddess of reason, wisdom, intelligence, skill, warfare, everything that a woman empowers, and even just handicrafts and domesticity and all of those things as well. And those also are in all those art historical paintings that we totally. are familiar with from the Western canon, where Diana is pictured with her retinue bathing and is surprised by Acteon and then she unleashes um, his dogs against him, turns him into a stag and his dogs kill him. Right. So I mean the, the, there are these like backdrops of the, of the female I think um, and her capabilities <laughs> in nature. Well we talked about this just you already touched on this for a second but I'm going to ask it again a little bit more thoroughly. So throughout these paintings you have depicted your figures from an array of viewpoints. Is there a meaning behind these different views? I think it's sort of to engage the viewer. Uh, I, I mean, I, I know when I'm painting them, I don't have uh, like a specific narrative in mind, but I will let the paint and her expression and stance evolve as I have a dialogue with the canvas as I'm painting. And it'll click, there'll be something that's just right. It's the, it, I think it's the nuance of the expression and the pose that seems to me to be initiating that dialogue and it, it, where it's specific enough but open-ended enough and it's, it's a sweet spot, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 don't, I'm, I sort of know it when I see it, but I have to find it and right. find it in painting it. So tell us maybe a little bit about the sense of place in these environments. Do you, are these places that you have been? I think a lot of them are based on these canoe trips. I mean, I, I don't, I, they're, uh, the Boundary Waters is, doesn't look exactly like this, but it has, it's a very forested area and it's completely without outside reference. I mean, you can get in there and you have to portage your way in and you, you are, in this antediluvian landscape that hasn't changed for thousands of years and it's very primeval you hear loons and Amazing. the aurora borealis and it's mm -hmm. creepy and fabulous so it i think i'm basing them partly on that experience if not visually explicitly then in the feel of the the uh the sequestered nature mm -hmm. and how you are removed from civilization well they feel very um intimate and personal like you know these places well I think. Yeah, I, I feel that that's the source of them. Mm -hmm. 
So um, <laughs> what about kind of touching on the mythology? Do you want to talk about any of the symbolism directly? Like when I was talking about the canoe or journeys, what do you think are the, are the real turning points? I think that the work that preceded this was actually more explicitly about the, a mythological base. These, I tried to depart a little bit from that and let the images conjure up things that are in all of us, <laughs> possibly in all of us. Uh, you know, as while Stevens is doing in his response to this landscape in Florida, uh, I think what's so interesting is he picked up on the religious part of it, because if you look at the language that brings forth him and him, beholder, behold, blessed. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's, like a, it's like a psalm or a hymn to Definitely. nature. So in, in a way, I think my works are a little bit that way, I think. They're, I think, channeling these different elements, trying to evoke like how beautiful, paint, how beautifully paint and art can represent our experience and connect us to these archetypal things, um, myths, legends, the Bible, the stories that we've heard, the, the images that we've seen in Western art. So it's both specific and more universal. Well, similarly to the poem, I think the work can be just taken at straight face value for the beauty and nature, or if you want to take a deeper dive into the mythology and the iconography, you can do that too. Yeah, it's, that's what's so great about art. It is, I isn't think it? It's, uh, there are entry points and um, it doesn't, I think it's a, it, it has to be both specific and universal. I guess the more I see, the more I, and read, the more I think that one, if you just try and hit a very generalized note about something in literature or art, it's not going to work. Like sometimes the most specific stories end up resonating in the most broad way because perhaps we're all telling the same stories over and over in a way, in some different version. The Greeks so, had it right there. Well, the Greeks and, and their goddesses and kind of going back to um, talking about the nude figure and how at first they had clothes and then suddenly they don't, which to me kind of makes them more powerful. And then I'm wondering, do we want to talk about the female gaze? Yeah, I mean, I think there are other artists who are maybe more involved with uh, uh, repurposing that gaze. There's been a lot made in, I think, Western in recent art, a recent criticism of Western art that it privileged, quote unquote, a, a male looking at the nude. And now women are painting nudes in contemporary art and that changes the balance. And I think for me, it was just important to show a woman with some agency in the right. paintings that she wasn't the creation of somebody else, like wasn't being directed by someone else or story wasn't being told by someone else. You're she controlling the dialogue in her. Going her own way right, and, right. and that she appeared to have a purpose that was of her own making. And I think that is perhaps where that, uh, where I dovetail with that recent re-examination of the male gaze without explicitly satirizing it or critiquing it or whatever. It, it's, it's more a question of agency, I think, telling one's own story. Mm -hmm. I love that. This has been a wonderful visit. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for making this happen. This has just been incredible. Everyone who's working at the gallery has just been so wonderful. And I am in your debt to have this in real life and have this lovely opportunity. It's just really wonderful. Well, Thank it's you. certainly been our pleasure and an honor to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>